But that's a, that's a let's possibility. Allow, let's allow it 12 elements rather than six elements. Let's allow it twice around the table so everybody gets two bites of the apple mm, okay. rather than one. Okay. okay. John? So I must start. Yes. Um, a young girl is, uh, arrives home at the end of the evening. Clouds are beginning to form. It's like a rainy night. She's, uh, let's say she's in her 20s. She's come home from work. She lives alone. She comes in her apartment. Perhaps a storm begins outside. She uh, takes her coat off, she relaxes, perhaps has a drink. Normal life at the end of the day. And the storm begins to intensify outside. Then it begins to rain. And you see the rain hitting the windows. And perhaps, uh, there's a television or a radio. And it reports uh, some, uh, a murder across town on the east side. It's a very strange kind of murder. It's uh, a body was found and its face, the face of the corpse was cut off. Just the face. And uh, this girl has the sense as she walks down the hallway to her bedroom that there's someone out there who's perhaps collecting faces. And she feels not only fear, but guilt somehow, like she's a part of it. And there's a giant crash of lightning and, and the power in her, her apartment goes out. And this is just as she opens the door to her bedroom and there's this blue light coming through the window. She looks across the room, and <laughs> the light focuses on her pillow, and the face is there. She smooths out the pillow. No face. Nothing there. Just a smooth pillow. The lights come back on. The power cut is out, you know. Everything's fine. She's got dinner with friends across the city. She goes down to the, the subway, sits down, you know, on, on any kind of subway clientele, just, you know, folks, folks there reading bestsellers and, and you know, odd bag ladies, and, but generally it's sort of ordinary, nothing, nothing very threatening. And the, the, the PA system begins to whisper to her, and she's not quite sure. It's either saying to her, you're next, or you did it. <laughs> so, you know, she, she looks around, no, nobody else seems to be noticing anything. But again, there's, you're next, <laughs> or whatever. So she gets off the other end, goes to see her friends. And as she walks through the door, they all... They don't obviously back away, but they, 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 they look at her a bit askance, and... something is clearly wrong. So she says, well, what's wrong? Is, is it me? Uh, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> um... Is it me, she says. And uh, the host at the table says, yes, but only a little part of it is you. See, um, we've known each other now. The girl's name is Janet. We've known each other now, Janet, how long? She says, ooh, since, uh, since I was very small, since I was three. And, uh, <coughs> The guy says, um, see, all that time, in a way, you've been in training. And everybody at this table has been in training. See, there's a, a problem with our faces, Janet. Our faces are fake things. Our faces have always been fake things. They're things we put on over our truest feelings. 
And it is the belief of this community gathered around this table that it's best for the world if we remove the fakery from life with scalpels, that we go about the city nightly and we remove the faces of the liars and the cheats and the hypocrites who occupy the planet with us. But after tonight, our great plan is... She just slams her hand down the table and says, You're crazy! And she leaps up, gets the hell out of the house. It's now storming down. So she's sort of rushing off to the storm and the rain and battling, but just wants to get away, wants to get away. She's maybe heading towards the police station, but no way, no, no. She's not actually going to report these old friends of hers to the police. But she's got to go somewhere. She's got to talk to somebody. Who can she trust? These people she's known for ages. But, well, if it's not the police, well, there's the press. And there's this guy she used to go out with. Maybe he writes for The Voice, or maybe he writes for The Times. I don't know. But she goes, say The Times. She goes there, because late at night, there may still be somebody there. Goes in. Luckily, he's there. Hasn't seen her for ages. Hey, happy to see her. It's normality. It's a newsroom. It's kind of messy, and there's people sitting around. Phone's ringing. Noise. She's wet. He buys her some coffee, kind of gets her a towel for her hair, and he's normal. He's like the guy she's known, and they start talking, and she can't quite tell him what's happened. It just seems too weird. She just says, <laughs> these people, <laughs> dinner, they really freak me out. I don't know. don't know what it was. But they start talking. She's starting to trust him. Something's going on between them. So he says, let's go out, let's get you, you know, you didn't get your dinner, let's go out, we'll go get something to eat. So they go out, they have a nice meal, it's relaxed, it's kind of, things are getting back to normality. They go to his place, just for a coffee, he'll take her home later. They go in, she goes in, she goes back to the bathroom, opens the door, and there's a faceless body in the bathtub. The faceless body hands her a scalpel <laughs> and says, cut me. She turns, starts to move out, and there's another faceless body behind her at the door holding another scalpel. She has no way to go. These are the only two areas in the room in which she can move. Almost paralyzed with fear, she takes the scalpel and starts to cut. She cuts off what is left of the face, cuts in, no blood comes out. She cuts deeper and deeper and deeper and cuts away level after level after level. No blood ever flows, no voice ever sounds until she is cut all the way through and there is nothing. She turns to the other person now with glee. She takes the scalpel and begins to cut the other faceless person. She repeats the same process, stroke after stroke after stroke, and again, there is nothing there. She now begins to understand something. It's not a voice. It's almost a feeling of understanding. And the understanding comes to her. And somebody or something says, this is the millennium. 2,000 years ago, we sent a man to this earth. That man was crucified and his mission failed. We came back 1,000 years later to find out if there had been progress, if we could find another on this earth. We have not, we failed in our search and we withdrew. Nobody knew we were here in the year 1000. We have come back again in the year 2000. We have found that person. That person is you. And your job is to <laughs> reveal the wisdom that failed to be revealed 2,000 years ago. 
Janet rejects this because, again, she thinks this is crazy. She goes to sleep. She's not having any of this. She's rejecting it all. She knows she's the chosen one. The audience knows she's the chosen one. She begins the second day by, in, in an act of rejection. As she goes through an attempt at a normal day, what begins to happen is that it moves beyond the body. <clears throat> she looks at photographs of the old friend she had the dinner party with. She looks at a, a newspaper article written by the, the journalist friend of hers with, with a headshot of him. And the photographs begin to move, as does her reflection in the mirror. And what all these images are saying to her is, there are no surfaces. It's not only the bodies that don't have surfaces, there are no surfaces. Every surface you think is in this world is an illusion. Your job, your role, the role you were born for, is to reveal to the world the absence of surface. It's not enough to take the skin off. It's not enough to be a serial killer. You must go beyond that act to reveal the secret reflection to reveal the life beyond the mirror, the life behind the photographs, the life behind the face. Th these are a series of, sh of shock moments that work through the day. That summation of that mission is revealed towards the end of the second day. When she calls back the friends, she says, I'm, I'm receiving other messages, you know, I, perhaps I shouldn't have left the dinner party. She calls the guy from the newspaper who now speaks to her in a different way, more reminiscent of other people she'd met before. All these people know something, but now they speak not in that revelatory way, but in a respectful way. And they suggest that perhaps what they need is, is another meeting. Another meeting which will be bigger than the previous meeting. A meeting that will involve more people. And that meeting will be held in Central Park. It's evening. She's led to Central Park. And there are thousands of people converging around the edges. Some faceless, a mass of pulp, some with their faces. But all seem to be driven by some inner voice, a confluence, a, a moment that they're all driven to. And she begins to be caught up in this, in this, in this drive. And suddenly out of the crowd, there's this, there's this man who turns and sees her and, and their eyes meet for a moment. And there's something between them that's human that's not uh, savage, or ripping faces, or, or, or a crazy uh, unreality, but there's something in their gazes that, tell, that tells each one, this is somebody I can trust. But they're very quiet because there's a giant crowd. And the people around Central Park whose faces remain, each pull out of their pockets knives, scalpels, garden implements, pieces of glass, and they all begin to tear their faces off. And as they tear their faces off, they begin to chant. These strange sounds come out. They're, they're like words, but they're not words. And this man gets closer to, to, our, to our heroine, Janet, and she, she grabs him and says, please, let's go. Let's get away from here. And somehow they, they move away from the crowd as these bleeding faces are dropped into Central Park. 